Well, hello everyone. This is uh, I'm talking. I'm John Maloney, and I'm going to talk about GP. And uh, we started this session 20 minutes late, so we're going to go till about 10 minutes of two. Um, I'll try to uh, sort of keep things short so we can get to lunch. Uh, okay. So uh, what is GP? GP is a free general-purpose blocks language uh, that I've been developing along with uh, Jens over there and Yoshiki right here, and uh, <clears throat> it's designed to be sort of the next step after Scratch. Uh, oh, before I get started, I want to make sure I don't run out of time. So I want to start up this little app here, and I'll put in 25 minutes. And uh, this app, as you may have guessed, is written in GP. Uh, so this is going to gradually increase, and, and we'll get like a green circle increasing as, as we go. So I'll check that periodically. OK, so this is the GP user interface. and um, uh, as you can see, it's like Scratch. It has it has a, a palette of blocks. It has different categories. Uh, unlike Scratch, it doesn't have uh, color coding for the categories. It has a, sort of a resizable stage area, a place down here to put blocks uh, to build scripts. And then the, probably the most interesting thing is this area under here, which uh, is where the sprites library would go in Scratch. Uh, but it has different terminology. It says classes and instances of classes. So I'm going to sort of show you a little bit about, um, about how all of that works. Uh, so the first thing, I guess, is to sort of start out where, where we, we sort of know where we are. So I'll just um, I'll do something you can do in Scratch, which is I'll make this guy uh, move here. So as you can see, there's a little sort of sprite-like thing. And uh, I can make a, an animate block as like a forever loop, and I can kind of get him moving like this. Uh, an interesting thing is that if I, uh, if I put this under a go block, and I make sort of a bunch more of these guys, and click the go button, then they're all going. So this is a lot like cloning. This is almost exactly like cloning in Scratch, but we're using different terminology. We're using class instance terminology. So the, the sort of thing that I had originally was an instance of a class called my class. And I've made all of these, uh, these sprites, or th uh, these instances. Uh, and they're, they're, all sort of, they're all sort of equivalent. So even though I start with uh, a particular instance, I can look inside of any of these. And, and uh, an interesting way you can sort of tell that they're different is you can, you can create an instance variable. So maybe I'll create a variable called speed. Uh, and I'll make a couple of instances by just clicking here. And uh, I'll set speed to different things. So I'll set it to, uh, to 1 for this guy. And I'll set it to, so notice that as I click between these, this arrow jumps between them. So now I've got this guy selected. And I'll set his speed to 2. And you see that like his speed is 2. This guy's speed, oh, is still nil. So I better set that to something. I'll set that to 3. So we should have, oh, this, oh I must have missed one. So we've got one, two, and three. And this is important because we're going to have a race. So, um, so let's, uh, let's actually put them all at the same starting position. So at the beginning, I'll, uh, I'll set all of their x position to um, minus 200. And let's see what happens. So now we've got these three sprites racing. And you can see that they all have different speeds. And you can actually sort of. Uh, sort of sort of move between them and see, oh, what's the speed of that guy? What's the speed of that guy? And as you do, you so, you're sort of seeing the arrow change. So the idea here is to reinforce with concrete instances this idea of uh, classes. Um, all right, so I want to do some sort of more interesting things. So let's say instead of uh, just moving, I'll make it sort of uh, point towards the mouse and move. So I can say, set my direction. Uh, and I, I have this idea that there's, there's a block that says point towards the mouse, but I'm not quite sure what category it is, and there's a lot of categories. So I'm going to use this little feature here called the block finder, and, um, and I'll just type direction. Uh, so let's see, direction to mouse, good. So I've got that block. So I'll sort of say point towards the mouse. Um, I'm going to just move a constant amount, one. Uh, and now let me sort of hit go. And you see all these guys are sort of, sort of going towards the mouse. But I'm feeling a little nervous about this. Like, they're all converging on me. So I think I want to change this a little bit. And I, I remember somewhere that if you, 
if you turn at a right angle to the to the radius of, or something that, that like you get something that's kind of going tangent to the circle. So I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of throw in at like a turn 90 block here, and uh, where they all go. Well, I'll just I'll just make some more, so it can clear. Make a bunch of guys. These just get put in random places. Get them all going, and now you see they're sort of circling the mouse, um, but they're just going in exact circles. So what I'd like to do is is sort of if I reduce this angle, uh, then I can make them sort of spiral in. So this is like spiraling down the drain um, uh, effect. And uh, so that, that's with, like, I just made a few instances by hand. But let me, um, let me make a few more instances. There's actually a block that makes new instances. So I could say, uh, I could make 100 instances, let's say, of this guy and, uh, and tell them all to go. And oh, uh, let's get rid of that block that says go to 100, because I'd like them all to start at random places. So let's clear again, make 100 instances, tell them all to go. And now we've got this kind of cool interactive thing where they're all spiraling towards wherever the mouse is. Um, so if I like that, I might want to save it as an application. So I'll just click this button and call it uh, down the drain. Um, pardon my capitalization error. Um, and that should show up in my GP folder here. Uh, oh, here it is, right. And if I run this, um, it will just start up and we've got our down the drain game, uh, which doesn't really do anything, <laughs> but it's fun to look at. And so that, that project that I started at the beginning, you can see I've used up um, about a quarter of my time now. That's a, that I built in GP itself, and uh, it's actually a useful application. So that shows one of the goals of GP, maybe not completely achieved yet, is the, is the goal of allowing people to make applications that are useful and to deploy them as little sort of double-clickable things they can, they can just run on, on their computer. Um, all right, let me show another example here. So I, another th one question you might ask about GP is, how does GP differ from Scratch? You know, what's the, what, are the, what are the new things that it adds? Uh, so one of the things it adds is the ability to draw its own costumes. Um, <clears throat> so, so, uh, so one of the things I can do, by default we have this little sort of uh, spaceship-y thing, uh, but I can just replace that with a generic uh, 100 by 100 bitmap. So here's a, just, a, a, just a, a gray bitmap. And then I can run this command that draws a yellow circle in it. And then I can run another couple of circle commands that make some uh, small black circles and one that makes a little horizontal rectangle. And so I've, I've made a, a face with all of this, and I can sort of put this all together as a single script that, that draws a face. Um, it's a little small, so I think I'll just, uh, just increase this scale by, let's see, I'll just click that a couple of times. Okay, so now I have this cool face. The only thing I don't really like this gray border, so I'm gonna expand this block. Uh, all of the blocks in GP, or can't, any block in GP can have this uh, this little arrow that lets you expand out and get some optional arguments. So here there's an optional argument that lets me fill the background with, with a color, and I'm using transparent here. So I get rid of that gray background. Um, so that's kind of cool, but now that I've drawn this, I'd like to animate it. So the cool thing about generating a costume programmatically is that you can, you can parameterize it, so you can pass in some parameters um, that control it. So, so here's, uh, here's a little script that I wrote. Um, and what this script is doing is it's, uh, it's computing the sine function, uh, sort of a function of time, and uh, it's generating this variable r that's sort of varying between like 10 and 14. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is just sort of drop the, oh, well, actually first I'm going to put all of this in an animate, so it's constantly updating the costume, start that running. You're not seeing any changes yet because the parameters are all constants. Um, but, uh, but now I can drop in this my r variable and, uh, and drop it into the radius slot. And now we have a sort of, a sort of maniac looking sort of smiley face, a little scary. <coughs> so that's one of the cool things you can do with GP. With just a few blocks, you can, you can generate interesting uh, pictures and then you can control them with software. Uh, another thing you can do with GP, which is something you can also do with Snap, is make composite objects. So here I've made, uh, I've made this kind of cool car, 
and, uh, and it moves. And I've also made these wheels. Well, I'll just hit go. And they turn, uh, but there's a problem, which is the car is sort of disconnected from the wheels. So what I'd like to do is, uh, let me make the stage a little bigger, is I want to make a composite object. This is not news to anybody who's used Snap, but um, not surprisingly, because Jens uh, worked on this, we have composite objects in GP. So I can attach the wheel to whatever is under it. In this case, there might be several objects, so I'm going to, I can select. So I'm attaching it to the body and attach it this wheel uh, to the body also. And now, hopefully, when I say go, we got a car that sort of acts like a single object with moving wheels. And the cool thing is you can then do other things to that. So you could make it, uh, you could make it go uphill by, oops, by turning it. I should be on the body. Okay, come back. Oh, I guess I'm making it go downhill. There, now it's going uphill. OK, so, um, so composite objects, nice, neat thing. Let me show you also some uh, manipulation of pixels. This is inspired by uh, Mark Guzdale's work with um, teaching computation using, using media. So he call it, he's written a whole book called um, some, something like uh, Learning Python with Computation with Media or something like that. Um, so, uh, so if I go to examples and I go to the demo projects, there's a pixel category. And uh, one of the examples, the nice thing about these, a lot of these media computation examples is that you can, you can do some interesting, make some interesting effects with just a few blocks. So uh, Mark invented this abstraction, which is, uh, which is this idea of a, of a, of a pixels reporter, uh, which just returns all the pixels in the picture. And then it's easy to iterate over one thing. Instead of doing a doubly nested loop over x and y, you can just iterate over the pixels. And then you can control the pixels by uh, either you can ask like what their red value is, or you can set the red value of a pixel. So I'll just run this to so sort of show you how it works. Um, so an interesting thing when I did this experiment with, or I, we sort of did this activity with kids, is we talked a little, we talked a lot about information. So we talked about, uh, is it possible to get from here back to the original by just running it again? And surprisingly, I, I actually thought I was going to have to explain this. Somebody said, oh yes, because 255 minus 255 minus red gives you the original red back. They did the algebra. So I was like, whoa, cool. Um, the neat thing was maybe only one kid in this group like sort of saw that 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 sort of the, the 255s canceled out and everything. But as soon as they said it, all of the other kids, I don't know if they got it or not, but they all nodded like, oh yeah, of course. Um, so I thought they probably they got it. And they probably got it better uh, hearing it from one of their peers than they would have uh, from hearing it from, from me. Um, we can do some other things here. So uh, instead of setting red, green, and blue, if we go to the pixels category, um, we could set the gray scale to something. So uh, let's see, where's we set gray? Set gray. Um, so a, an interesting question is, what if we set the gray scale of each pixel to, uh, to, to, to the red value? Um, so you can kind of go through this question, like, is it going to be like my face going to look darker or lighter? And it turns out it looks lighter because there's a lot of red in my face. Uh, but if we if we like if we go with the the, the blue, then um, then it's going to be different. So it's darker because there's not as much blue as red. It's a little counterintuitive. You sort of you don't sort of realize that that like less blue is going to make it look darker until you do the experiment. So there's another kind of lesson here about you know, kind of uh, breaking down colors into components. And you can talk about how most human eyes have three color receptors and for red, green, and blue. And that's why we can sort of represent, approximate most you know, natural colors with only three different colors and stuff like that. So there's a lot packed into this uh, act set of activities with pixels. Um, Yes, we're getting short of time, so I'm going to sort of jump to some of the, the uh, deeper things you can do with GP. Let me just check my, yes, halfway through. Um, uh, quickly, let me show you one thing that, that's a little bit related to what Brian talked about. Um, just, it's just the tiniest touch of, of uh, sort of cloud computing. So we have these two blocks here, uh, put cloud data and get cloud data. So I can, I can put something here, I'll, t I'll type something totally uh, new, so you know I'm not cheating. Um, so I'll put Brian into the cloud, and then I can get that value back. Oh, thank goodness the network. I meant to test that before. <laughs> um, 
But you can you can do more than that. You can actually put put uh, you can put other things in. So so one thing is we have like some images here. So we have my my face. Uh, so John mugshot. So let's just go and and like put that data in the cloud. I suspect this might take a little bit of time just because it uh, like it would be a little slow. But let's try it anyway. So um, so I can get um, my costume like so, uh, and I'll say. Shop square. Oops, that's not where I want to put it. So we'll put that in the cloud. I'll put it under John. And okay, so it supposedly put it there. Now if I retrieve that data, okay, it's a bitmap, but I can't really see it yet. So let's um, first of all let me set the costume to something generic here. Okay. This is not set here. Oh, I see. I don't have a GP costume. <laughs> um, so I'll set it to this beach costume, so you know that like something has actually changed. And I'm going to uh, set my costume to the result of fetching the costume from the cloud. And hopefully, and yes, I did get my original picture back. So that's kind of cool. And and this is super compelling to kids, as Brian said. There's, there's something that seems very relevant to them about doing anything that involves the cloud. Now, a, a, a pretty neat thing is that the cloud. Um, the server that was written is actually written in GP itself, and um, you know I can I can sort of get some stats about it, and I'm going to now do something. Um, I'm going to enter developer mode. Da 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 da. And with great res power comes great responsibility. So uh, we have sort of a beginner mode or a, a sort of yeah sort of beginner mode. Um, authoring mode is what I call it for GP, and then there's a developer mode which has sort of more features, uh, but also more danger. So uh, one of the dangerous things here is that we can kind of uh, look at and even change the system. Uh, but we'll, the first thing I'm going to do is just look, so that's not so dangerous. So one of the things I can look at is, uh, as I can look at the code for the cloud data server, and I can actually find um, uh, somewhere in here is a handle the stats message. So here's the code that's running on the server. The server is actually running on a, a virtual server uh, owned by DigitalOcean out in California somewhere, or New York City. Not sure exactly where the server is. But I just have this, uh, this GP server running continuously. Um, and that's the, that's the code that sort of implements this. So it does a, a sort of an RPC call to get this data back and just shows it here in this, in this thing. Um, another thing I can do, though, is I can actually look, now that I'm looking at sort of inside the system, I can look at the system itself. So there's this whole user interface is called the, uh, the project editor. And so if I, if I go to the uh, project editor and um, like so, I can find a block in here that I can maybe, maybe make a change to the way it draws itself. And so there's a, there's a method here called draw top bar. And uh, this is the top bar, so this area up here. And you can see it's being, well, I can see because I've looked at this in advance, that there's a place where it's drawing a, a bitmap with ray 200. So I'm just going to rip that guy out and put in, I think just for the fun of it, a color random block. Um, so nothing happens immediately. So first I have to save my changes. Still nothing happens because this isn't redisplaying until I change the size of the window. And so now every time I re change the size of the window, it's uh, a different color up here. Sometimes by, because it's random, it's sort of similar to the last color. Um, so how am I doing on time now? Still have a little time left. Um, Let's see. I want to make sure I get these ex expert things in before, because uh, like you, you've seen all the scratch-like things. So another thing that you can do in GP is um, uh, is you can you can sort of explore things like recursion uh, in a graphical way. And um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start out with this naive, naive view of of implementing uh, factorial. So I kn I know. I've been told that you can implement factorial in, it, in itself. So, so I'll, I'll, oh, I misspelled it, but who, so I can fix that. Factorial. OK, so you can implement factorial in itself, and it's going to take a parameter. Um, oops, a parameter. And I'll call it n. Um, and uh, so now I have factorial, and it's also it should be a function. So I'll make it a function block. So factorial, 
uh, of 10, and it doesn't return anything yet because I haven't implemented. So well, let's uh, sort of debug this into existence. So uh, I'm going to want to return something. And, um, and I think I remember that factorial of n is n times factorial of n minus 1. So, uh, so let's see, factorial of n minus 1. Let's say minus two. Let's see, n minus one. That's that's a stepping stone. Uh, times n, right? So n times factorial of n minus one. And uh, let's try it out for five. Let's say. And you guys all know there's a bug in this. Okay, so it looked looked bad there for a second. It looked like we had the spinning beach ball of death. But then we got this this uh, thing called a debugger. And uh, a f an early lesson to teach people is that in GP, the debugger is your friend. It's, it's telling you something useful. If you don't like what, you know, if you don't want to deal with it, you can immediately just close it. And kids, kids have no problem just ignoring and closing debuggers, I have to tell you. So it's, it's not really scary to them. They, they sometimes like miss important information because they're a little too quick to close it. Um, but, but here we see that, you know, we're sort of going nice, to, like factorial of five is determined by, uh, in terms of factorial of four, which is determined in terms of factorial three. Then we get down to something a little strange, factorial of zero, like, like uh, that can't really be useful. And negative numbers, no, something is wrong here. So what's wrong is, of course, that we're missing a base case. So we want to put in um, some kind of uh, test to see if n is, is less than two, and if so, do something about it. Um, so, uh, so I'll say, I'll put in a less than, less than or equals, I guess, is better. Oops. Grab that block. So if n is less than or equal to 2, uh, then I want to um, return. I'm going to just use this again. Return. Just return 1. And now let's see if we, we get, OK, factorial of 5 is 60. Is that right? It should be 120. Uh, maybe this should be less than or equal to 1. Let's try that. Um, yeah, so I usually use less than 2, or, or if it's less than or equal, it has to be less than or equal to 1. Um, so this is, all, this is interesting, but it actually still doesn't help you figure out how, it, how factorial works. I think a better, uh, a, a, another thing that you might want to do is you might want to sort of take it apart and see like, how each step works. And to do that, I'll make a couple of uh, variables. Um, so I'll make a, a variable called uh, uh, fact n minus 1 and, uh, and uh, result. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set my uh, fact of n minus 1 to be factorial of n minus 1. I'm going to set my result to be, to be this guy here. Um, and I'm, I'm going to return the result too. But before I return, I'm going to I'm actually want to sort of sort of take a little peek at what's going on here. So there's a category that's only available when you're in developer mode that has some some sort of sort of blocks for debugging stuff. So now if I like run this factorial, it actually stops as soon as it gets to that halt block. And when does it get to the halt block? Well, it gets to the halt block sort of when it's about to return from factorial two. Um, so. So it, this, yeah, that's funny. Why is it not showing? Ah, what? Oh, n times, yes, 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 yes you're right, you're right. I need to put in, um, that should be n times fact. Yeah, I actually think I should be using uh, different kind of variables. I should be using local variables, not instance variables. Sorry, my bad. problem with instance variables is that they're shared by all uh, all recursive cases so you they need to be like variables on the stack 
Okay, so now we ha now we can see factorial of n minus one is one, uh, n is two. So the the ah, oh, why is the product not two? N? Oh, this is wrong. This is not my fact. This should be uh, this this guy. Great demo job. All right, let's see if we've got something better. N two result. Two, yes. So that case is good. So I'm gonna I'm gonna hit resume. That will sort of sort of uh, go to the next case. So now we're like at three, and we're trying to compute factorial of three. Uh, oops, n minus one is not right. The result is zero. Oh, all right. Okay, I'll put this. I think we'll skip this. The rest of this demo. Ah, that was a good demo. <laughs> Come see me afterwards, and we'll debug this. Um, and since we're just running out of time, I think I will, um, I'll sort of, uh, sort of just say one or two quick things. Um, GP is, as I mentioned, free. You can, it's available for download uh, from gpblocks.org. Uh, there's a whole website about it. There's lots of examples you can look at. And uh, oh, I was also going to show one other tiny thing. It runs on lots of different platforms, uh, including. The iPad here, and uh, so so this is thanks to Yoshiki that we've we've have a prototype of it running on the iPad. We're not quite ready to share it, but if you want to be a, um, a a beta tester for the iPad version, come see us afterwards. And uh, also there are some handouts about GP uh, in the back of the room. I, some of you have found them, so please take one of those. And thank you very much.